Since the dawn of civilization, spies of every nation and culture have worked to infiltrate their adversaries and glean the information that will give their side the advantage. The stakes are sky high, the strategies varied and imaginative, and the ultimate sign of success is that no one ever even knew you were there. In each episode, we will explore the moral and ethical gray zones of espionage, where treachery and betrayal go hand in hand with cunning and courage. This is the Spycraft 101 podcast. Welcome to your clandestine classroom. This is episode number 32 of the Spycraft 101 podcast. Joining me today is Daniel Golden, a journalist and senior editor with ProPublica, who has also previously worked at Bloomberg News, the Wall Street Journal, and the Boston Globe. Dan was awarded the Pulitzer Prize for Beat Reporting in 2004 for his coverage of inequalities in American college admissions practices. These articles became the basis for his first book published in 2005 called The Price of Admission. I invited Dan onto the podcast today to talk about his second book, which he published in 2017. This one is titled Spy Schools, How the CIA, FBI, and Foreign Intelligence Secretly Exploit America's Universities. This is an amazing subject to me because I don't think many people realize that right now, while we often think of our own university campuses as intellectual or political battlegrounds, they're also very much on the front lines of modern day espionage activities between nations. Dan, thanks so much for coming on to talk to me today about your book. Thanks, thanks for having me, it's a pleasure. I'm glad, I'm glad to. You've been covering higher education topics for almost 20 years now. When did you first begin to notice the national security implications and these trends occurring that you cover in this book? Well, off and on over the years, when I covered higher ed at the Wall Street Journal, I sometimes wrote about the relationship of intelligence agencies and universities. Uh, I remember doing a piece a little bit after 9-11 about how the CIA was coming back onto American campuses and suggesting thesis topics and so on. But the immediate impetus for this book sort of came about by accident. I was at Bloomberg and I was working on a piece about Confucius Institutes, which are the institutes that China partly funds and staffs that are located on campuses around the world. At the time, there were more than 100 in the US. And the, the, the story was really about whether they were mouthpieces of propaganda, not whether they were outlets for spying. But I noticed a clipping about a professor at the University of South Florida who was Chinese American, and he had been uh, let go as director of the Confucius Institute there. And he had told the, uh, the local paper that the reason was it had to do with the FBI, and that he didn't elaborate. And I called him up and he, he wouldn't talk to me. But then a couple of years later, after, long after my story ran, he called me back. He said he wanted to tell his story and it turned out that what had happened was he had gotten in trouble at the university for you know, alleged financial finagling and other things. And the FBI had gone to him and they had said, you've got a choice. You can go to prison for your uh, wrongdoing or you can keep your tenured professorship at uh, South Florida and spy for us on China, or on your Chinese colleagues and so on. And he was a Chinese American professor, U US citizen. And uh, I wrote a piece about that and then I was talking to somebody I knew in the US government about it. And I said, you know, this was amazing. I had no idea the FBI did this. And he said, oh, oh yeah, this happens all the time. And he said also, you know, it's a two way street. We're uh, trying to recruit foreign students and professors at American universities to spy for us. And, and foreign countries are sending students and uh, professors to spy on us. So. I realized that this was more than an article, it was a book, and that's when I really launched into it. Hmm. Yeah, it's, it's a fascinating topic for sure, and it's amazing to think about everything that's going on around this because you're talking about, I, I don't know how many, but certainly, what would you say, hundreds of thousands of foreign students and foreign college employees in America, maybe? And, and I have no idea how many at American universities around the world as well, but these, these are huge numbers of people that are potential recruits for both sides. Would that be accurate? Yeah, a few years ago, the number of foreign students in the US topped a million. It's gone a little bit lower because of the pandemic, but it's basically around a million foreign students in the US and you know many thousands of uh, foreign faculty. I mean, how many would depend on whether you count somebody who was born abroad but is now a uh, permanent res resident or U.S. citizen, if you, if you count them as, as foreign or not. But 
There's also visiting researchers and scholars who come for a year or two. So it's quite a large number of, of, of people. Obviously, most of them are just here in their academic capacity, but some undefined number are working for one or the other side. Hmm. Makes sense. So what is it besides the number of people that are available, foreign people available here and, you know, Americans studying abroad? What is it that makes the colleges, higher education, such a battleground? Because a lot of these are, are young, uh, I'd say, uh, life inexperienced people. You know, not every 19 or 20 year old who's studying abroad is going to be useful from an intelligence perspective, but yet these agencies are all over the place. So why is that exactly? Well, that's a good question. And before I, I answer that, I'll just mention, I didn't give you the numbers on Americans studying in, in foreign countries, but it's in the hundreds of thousands, I think 150,000 or 200,000. So that's a good number too, some of whom might be working for our intelligence services. But in terms of why higher education is such an appropriate or not appropriate, but such a fertile ground for espionage, we have a revolving door kind of in this country between academia and government. So, you know, today's assistant secretary of state is tomorrow's professor. They're much more accessible at a university than they would be in a government uh, or in a business for that matter. And also universities conduct a lot of significant research, uh, technical research, some of it open, some of it secret, but a lot of it of interest to other countries. So that's why foreign countries are interested in, in American academia. And then in terms of our in intelligence agencies, you know, it gives them somebody, yes, they might be young, but they may well know the foreign language. They can move around abroad without much suspicion. Other countries also, universities have people who used to or will go to government jobs. So a lot of the same reasons apply. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You're talking about huge numbers here, like um, over a million people. Have you ever worked up or have you got an estimate on the percentage of people in higher education, students and faculty who might be involved or at least have been approached for this kind of thing from both sides? I would think that, you know, even 1% of people being approached is still 10,000 plus, right? Yes, I don't have an estimate, but I mean, there are, you know, surveys indicating that, that higher percentages than that of foreign students from countries of interest to the U.S., you know, in the Middle East and, and places like that, or Russia or China tend to be approached. Not that they necessarily agree, but, you know, nobody could put an exact number, but I think it's, it's you know, significant enough to be a important front in kind of the espionage secret wars. Hmm. Wow. It sounds like it for sure. So would you say that, would you be comfortable saying at a minimum, we're talking about potentially thousands of people who are working for one side or the other in these higher institutions of learning? Or at least approached. It's harder to put a number on working. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Very hard. I'm sure they catch individuals. They don't catch large groups. I would, I would expect typically. So a lot of my podcast, I almost always deal with cold war era spycraft, which is a fascinating topic, but there's really not a lot of that going on these days. These students, they're not out making dead drops in a park and leaving a coded message, you know, somewhere for a handler or anything, are they? I don't think that's as typical now, but I'm not expert on the specific spycraft, but what I can say is that in the Cold War, when students were approached, it was more likely at a international conference because there weren't these huge numbers of foreign students in the U.S. Or it might be, you know, a delegation coming to visit an American university, something like that. But now, you know, another aspect of recruiting is convenience. That if the, you work for the FBI, you can drive down to the, the nearest university campus and find plenty of foreign students of interest. You don't have to go to a uh, international student group conference, which was often the case in the, in the Cold War era. But, you know, professors and students have always been of active in espionage. I mean, think of, you know, Cambridge University in the 1930s, for example. Mm, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've read quite a bit about Cambridge in the 1930s, for example. That's, that's a nexus of so many things that happened through the rest of the 20th century, really. Definitely. And that was a lot of recruitment for people that were not going to do anything, if I recall correctly, so much at Cambridge, but they were going to be moving into positions of power and influence later on in their careers. Because if you're at Cambridge, you're, you're essentially an up and comer in society and in government at large at that time. Absolutely. So they went into key positions in the English government. Is that why you think a lot of this recruitment is happening? Is it just kind of planting the seeds that will pay off in 20 or 30 years? Or is it more like a immediate 
pay off in whatever the university is working on, for example? I think it's both. You know, I think it's both. There's certainly cases in my book and that I came across where they were obviously interested in uh, the immediate research that was going on. But I think there's other cases where they might be cultivating somebody because they see them as a future person of, of influence in the U.S. government or, or, or business. Okay. Okay, sure. You mentioned the FBI approaching the person from the Confucius Institute earlier. So how exactly is the FBI involved in universities? How are they attempting to you know, prevent espionage from taking place on an American college campus? Well, I think, you know, my book focuses less on how they're preventing it and more on how they're recruiting people to, you know, spy for the U.S. government. And there, as I say, they, they tend to use leverage. So in that South Florida case, which I don't think was unusual, they knew that the professor was in, in trouble. It was a Chinese-American professor. They figured he would have little choice but to take the offer. You know, you have to spy for us. And there have been some recent trials, you know, of Chinese-American researchers who are accused of not disclosing affiliations to China and so on. And in one of these cases, I think it was An Ming Hu, the professor at the University of Tennessee, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, there was some testimony that the FBI had, uh, before they charged him with having undisclosed affiliations in China, they tried to recruit him to, you know, to, to gather intelligence for the FBI. So a lot of times they're using a pressure point to get somebody to work for them. Other times, there, there may be other motivations. They may not need that pressure. Hmm. Do you think or have you found any uh, evidence, any way of them like successfully recruiting people so far? I mean, of course, they're going to keep that very close hold for many years. But has that ever come up in your own research? Well, the guy at South Florida agreed. He had no choice. He didn't provide a lot of information, but he did provide a few things. Hmm. Okay, yeah, I can imagine if they approached him, they've approached 100 or 500 or 1,000 more. Yeah, like I said, well. I was told it was very common. Mm -hmm. And I, I think there's no doubt about that, that that's a standard technique. Hmm. Yeah, I can, I can believe it. I mean, a lot of people, I'm trying to imagine if you're coming to America and you're spending years here as a student or as a faculty member, I'm guessing many of those people, they, they grow to like it. They grow to love it here. They want to stay here. In some situations, they're going to want to you know, fully assimilate and fully become American and leave their, their homeland behind. Certainly not every case, but some people I think would see this as an, as an opportunity to reinforce their own position here as well. Yeah, that could be. I could see that too. So we mentioned the FBI working on the colleges. Do the faculties themselves, do the administrators or staff of these universities, are they involved in any way in preventing like economic espionage on campus? Well, that, that's a good question. I mean, traditionally, one of the reasons that universities have been fertile ground for spying is that, and, and for economic espionage, is the kind of open global culture of universities. You know, they're used to collaborating across national lines everybody's joining together for the common cause of, of science and knowledge and advancing world progress. And all of that's very admirable, but it does lead to a certain naivete so that there's less concern within a university typically than there might be in government or business about why exactly does this guy want to collaborate with me? I mean, you know, working together on research with people from other countries is, is the norm. Now, in recent years, there's been this crackdown on, on connections with China so that I think there's a lot of fear in academia now about collaborating with Chinese researchers because the Justice Department has this China initiative that was looking very closely at those partnerships. So in, in that realm, I think the naivete has been replaced by you know wariness, if not panic. But I think in general, that's still the academic state of mind. And it's a good state of mind. It's just that it leaves a place vulnerable. And I, I don't think that there's a great deal of sophistication among most academics about things like intellectual property law and how do I protect my invention from being stolen? I don't think they're, they're experts on patents and, okay, do I need to protect this with a patent in another country or not? Are those kinds of things so that makes them a bit more vulnerable. Right. That's that's kind of what I was thinking as I first dove into your book is that it seems very antithetical for these colleges to embrace working with the FBI to target or exploit a lot of their own tuition paying students, for example. And it kind of goes against what I imagine is 
the the culture, the college culture, you know, of inclusivity and learning from each other and that sort of thing. But I was wondering, you know, the colleges, they also have a lot to lose. For example, if their research is going right out the door immediately, I was wondering if that was like a, a motivation for them to kind of stem the tide of this economic espionage. Yeah, I think that that is a bit of a motivation. I mean, the universities want to claim, want to own the the research, the inventions that their professors come up with, or at least co-own them with the professor. They want to commercialize that and make money off it. So they have a financial incentive to protect their inventions. On the other hand, they also have a lot of financial incentives not to alienate foreign countries. A lot of American universities, not just these collaborations, but you know, they've opened campuses overseas. They bring in uh, full tuition paying students from other countries. The being international is an important both revenue source and kind of prestige brand. And as I say, this is less true with China now than it was a few years ago when every American university was trying to have a bigger presence in China. But rest of the world, a lot of it's still true. And so there, there's financial motivations going in both directions. I mean, they also in terms of protecting their research, they don't want to get the U.S. government upset because they obviously get a lot of money in grants from uh, federal grants, uh, including from intelligence agencies. So there's money coming in, in in that direction too. I mean, when I was a kid, you know, in the uh, 1960s and 1970s, universities and, and colleges did not want the FBI or the CIA on campus. In the civil rights movement in Vietnam, there was a, you know a major gulf for falling out between academia and American intelligence agencies, and uh, the universities wanted nothing to do with them. But as I mentioned before, that changed after 9-11, and ever since there's been uh, increasingly close cooperation, both you know the grant money coming in, as I mentioned, those CIA and FBI and other intelligence agencies coming on campus to recruit students, more uh, research being done for them. Those ties are pretty close now. Hmm. Yeah, that's that's quite a shift for sure. That's not really something I was expecting. And I can see how these universities are really caught between a rock and a hard place, financially speaking. I, I don't have the numbers in front of me, everything, but I think that out-of-state tuition is typically like two or three times as much as in-state tuition. And I assume that all foreign students are paying that out-of-state tuition. So, you know, if they for every Chinese student that they have to decline or, or kick out or something like that, they're losing the equivalent of three U.S. stateside students' tuitions, I would imagine. Yeah, I think that at least there used to be a few universities that had an out-of-country tuition that was higher than the out-of-state tuition. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah, that's that's a enormous cash cow for them. And one, I'm sure they're very concerned about upsetting, to say the least. And the foreign students that they bring in are generally affluent foreign students because most American universities which cover economic need for domestic students, you know, and that they're called need blind. Most of mm -hmm. them, with a few exceptions, like, you know, the, the really top schools are not need blind for foreign students. So they're only going to take foreign students who can pay. They're not, they may not take a foreign student who needs a scholarship. And mm, sometimes, right. of course, the foreign government pays the tuition. But in any case, in addition to bigger tuition being paid, there's less scholarship money available for foreign students. Hmm. Well, yeah, they're, they're for sure caught in a bind there. No question about it. So you mentioned earlier the, the South Florida professor who was caught because he was facing some financial charges, but obviously that would be a very small percentage of foreign students and faculty. So what other methods do you think that FBI is using to uh, potentially recruit people, foreign students on these campuses? Any, any idea? Well, yeah, American intelligence, I think they use some of the time-honored methods of, of spycraft. For example, they might be friendly with a faculty member at a university who might have ties to FBI or CIA, might have a foreign student who seems promising, and invite them to, you know, ask them to write a paper that they get paid for, that, you know, I'll, you know or meet a, meet a, meet a friend, meet, meet somebody who would like to hire them part-time. And then, you know, once somebody, a foreign student is his work is, is getting paid for, for some task by CIA or FBI, you know, we kind of own them because if that information got back to their home country, they'd be in trouble. So, you know, we use that approach. Foreign espionage services use that approach as well. They'll, they'll find a way through some pretext to have somebody get paid by a uh, intelligence agency, and then, uh, then the person is compromised. Mm. 
Other yeah. things can just be socially cultivating somebody, you know, through friends and contacts, get to know them well, take them out on a boat, take them to a ball game, make friends, and then uh, broach the subject then. Sure. Yeah. Personal relationships matter and making them feel important and valued matters. And, uh, you as know, well. one of the chapters in my book was a fascinating look, I think, at the mid career program at the famous John F. Kennedy School at Harvard, which brings in a lot of mid career people. Up, up and coming business people, up and coming politicians, uh, policymakers in foreign countries, they come to, for the academic year to Harvard. And in that same Kennedy School class, in that same program, are undercover CIA agents who are there using their foreign cover as, you know, political officer at an embassy or uh, wh whatever it might be. And so that gives an opportunity for the American intelligence to get to know and, and buddy up to up and coming influencers in other countries and then use those contacts later on. Oh, wow. Yeah, that makes perfect sense, especially if they get to know each other under the cover of, you know, State Department or, or whatever they're working with, then it makes recontact later on a lot more sensible. Of course, some of those foreign business people or policymakers or politicians in the program might also have an intelligence tie in their home country. <laughs> right. Nobody really right. knows who you're sitting next to in that program. Oh boy. Yeah. It's the great game for sure, isn't it? Yes. So you have several really in-depth stories about specifics, individuals and specific activities that took place. And the first one is, is amazing to me, really. It was just mind blowing as I read through this. Can you talk about this cloak of invisibility that was invented at Duke University a little bit? That was, I just blew my mind. Sure. That case involved a lab run by a professor at Duke named David Smith. And he was a pioneer in inventing what was called an invisibility cloak, essentially using something called metamaterials to create that weren't visible to certain uh, wavelengths. You know, it's funded by the, some of the research was funded by the Pentagon. It has both civil and civilian and military applications. And one student in his lab who came from China, his name was Ruopong Liu, did quite a few suspicious things. And Smith was not really on guard for this kind of thing, but he arranged a collaboration with some Chinese researchers, Liu did. Then he had them come over and they, they photographed the lab equipment. Liu shared some of the data and discoveries of the American students there with the Chinese lab. He, he, he wrote them up for the Chinese lab without, without telling Duke about it. He kind of deceived Smith into, into joining one of those Chinese talent programs that are very controversial to bring an American uh, scientist over to China to, to give, you know, technical advice and courses and so on. And Smith backed out of it quickly once he realized what it was. But Liu went beyond sort of academic, the normal academic behavior in, in all these ways. And finally, Smith realized what was going on and he took uh, away Liu's key to the uh, key to the lab. And uh, but Liu then went back to China started a company working in a similar field with, with some of the similar research and its value went way up and he became a billionaire and an influential person in China. <laughs> yeah, it's unbelievable stuff, really. I was kind of metaphorically pulling my hair out as I read through the chapters and just saw all these obvious indicators of this you know, nefarious and manipulative activity. And yeah, what it it, just to like give you a sense of how I got story. onto that, there, was, there used to be something, I'm not sure it still exists, called the National Security Higher Education Advisory Board made up of university presidents and they would get briefings from the FBI or the CIA about pressing matters of, of interest to universities. I used public records requests to get the agendas of the meetings of the National Security Higher Advisory Board. And one of the agenda items was, you know, Dr. David Smith of Duke University will talk about how this Chinese graduate student came into his team under false pretenses and ended up taking the research and costing Duke a lot of money and patents and so on, and didn't identify the graduate student, but I you know, ultimately figured out who he was. And then Smith was very forthcoming, and, and that's how that chapter started. Hmm. That's incredible stuff. So this invisibility cloak, and I, I will admit I did not understand all the science behind it, of course, but as I understood it, it was not invisible so much to the naked eye, but it was invisible to a wide variety of like detection systems that might be on use in use on like the battlefield or a future battlefield. Is that about yeah, right? I think it had potential. Like a lot of inventions, you know, it was, it, it was the beginning of something. It wasn't something that you could take today and you know, make, uh, you know, a fighter plane invisible to anything, but it had a lot of potential for the future. 
Right. Yeah. The, the, it's very tantalizing information, tantalizing developments, and they're, you know, they're hitting their goals and they're, they're developing it further and all that. And it obviously shows a lot of promise for the future. And meanwhile, it's going out like simultaneously, it's going straight to China through Liu and his contacts. Is that right? That's right. I mean, now a lot of the research was not classified because it was at an early stage, but of course, you know, eventually as it gets more sophisticated, it will become classified in this way. The Chinese can, could get an early start on, on it and beat some of their Amer beats the American universities to articles and patents about it, which is important in sort of the competitive race. And, you know, what, what ultimately happened was when, when an article was published about it, it listed all these, you know, the Chinese collaborators and the Chinese organizations as funders. And uh, the Pentagon said, wait a minute, you know, we're giving you money to cloak weapons, make them invisible, and China's funding this. So they went to Duke and they said, we're not happy about this. And that's when it kind of all unraveled. Right, right. And Liu, as I understand it, he was not like the genius driving force behind all this. He was maybe treading water at best was the impression I got that he, he was not the genius inventor by any means. He was just kind of cashing in on the work of a lot of his fellow grad students there. That was my impression too. I mean, you know, I think he was very, he was very bright and he was very good at articulating what was being found as if he'd invented it. But in reality, he kind of had a short attention span and he was not the primary creative mind behind a lot of these developments. You know, it was other students who maybe didn't have the same gift of the gab that he did. Mm -hmm. Yeah, even, I mean, even given an unlimited budget, he probably would not have come up with this himself. He had to rely on his fellow students and then took it home. And now he is, like you say, he's a billionaire in China based on this and a lot of other patents he's got. And he's got an enormous, I guess he's got an entire building over there uh, for his company and just living the high life for sure based on work done by his fellow students at Duke, what, 12 or 15 years ago. That's right. Really, really unfortunate story and it's attention grabbing, but it seems like there's a lot of that going on as well. And I have no idea what the status of any of this stuff is now, but this work was being done in, what was it, 2007, 2008? So, you know, over 10 years of further development, both by the U.S. and presumably by China. So who knows where these technologies are at at the moment? Yeah, I, mean, I haven't kept up in the last couple of years, you know, it was probably five years ago or six years ago that I researched this. Mm -hmm. So were there any consequences, obviously not for him, he's back over there and he's doing great, but were there any consequences for David or for the program or for Duke University or anything like that? Well, I think that that, that episode got a lot of attention when my book came out, you know, there were follow-ups in other media on, on TV and so on. I testified in Congress. I think that it had an impact and, and it may have contributed to this crackdown in recent years on Chinese American researchers to look at their affiliations in China. Now, I have some reservations about the, the, the crackdown. It seems in a lot of cases to have gone too far and swallowed some people who, who were not spies or not really doing anything wrong. But I think that the wind changed in terms of American collaboration, American higher education collaborations with China and the government's view of them. And I think that episode probably played a role in that. Yeah, I can see that for sure. I mean, uh, there's no question that a lot of this is going on, but at the same time, people have been brought to trial and found not guilty for the things they're accused of. So right. that doesn't mean that every single person that's thought to be doing it is doing it, just a, probably a Yeah, there, there might be some overreach. And I also think there's an argument to be made that American higher education, as we discussed, could keep a closer eye on its own rather than the, the government kind of coming in with a little bit of a heavy hand, maybe. I agree. I mean, I feel like, you know, the, the U.S. government is the steward of its own taxpayer funds that it's delivering. You know, I, I get that part for sure. But I also want to think that American universities are advancing American interests above all else. Might be, might be an antiquated viewpoint, but I like to think that, you know, the American taxpayer and the American way of life is kind of getting the most benefit before anybody else out of research taking place in the United States being funded by U.S. taxpayers. Yeah, and I think there's some, you know, things that American higher education could do and maybe it has started doing that could help, you know. In the Duke case, I don't think there was a written collaboration agreement specifically spelling out, you know, what the Chinese collaborators had could have access to and what they couldn't, you know, so it was kind of a gray area. I mean, I think that, you know, universities could probably do a lot more to, to put all those kind of agreements down on paper in a sort of contractual form, 
so that any graduate student who stepped over the line would then, everybody would know where the line was. That's one thing. Another, and you know, I had this other chapter in my book about this Chinese university, the University of International Relations in Beijing, which is, at the time at least, was partly funded by the uh, Chinese security ministry, and it was known as China Spy University. And hmm. not everybody who went there came out as a spy, but it did produce a lot of China spies, and it was that's where it got its funding. And it was having exchange agreements with American colleges, like Marietta College in Ohio was one, UMass Boston was another. It seemed quite odd for American universities to have relationships with the school, but a lot of them didn't know what it was. It seemed like an ordinary school of international relations. And so that's the kind of thing where if they had more sophistication, they wouldn't have maybe an exchange agreement with that university, or they might look at, you know, if they get an applicant to grad school or for a teaching position or something, and, and, and University of International Relations is on their resume, maybe look at that person a little more closely. So there were some, you know, sort of practical things they could do to lessen the, the threat a little bit, maybe. But, you know, I don't know if they're doing them or not, but, but there are some steps higher education could take. You don't want to, in my opinion, undermine the global nature of academia. Collaborations and, and international research are important. And, they, you know, you don't want to become insular and fall behind as other countries move ahead in innovation. American research and innovation and higher education are kind of our calling cards and the rest of the world looks up to that, envies it, and, and it should stay that way. So we shouldn't, you know, retreat into a bunker or stop taking foreign students or anything like that. So I think some of these practical steps by American higher education might be the way to go. Yeah, I agree completely. And, you know, if you step back and take a look at the bigger picture, we we are and we always have been a nation of immigrants. I mean, that's, you know, we have the Statue of Liberty as the national symbol for a reason. And Ellis Island, everybody knows what Ellis Island is. And you know, certainly many immigrant communities are one of the things that makes America such a great place to live in, no question about it. And I'm glad that we're not just a, a, a monocultural society, for sure. At the same time, you know, that is something that leads to enormous vulnerabilities from an intelligence gathering perspective and a counterintelligence perspective. It, it makes us weak while it makes us strong in every single other area imaginable. You're so right. It's, it's a real paradox. It's a complex it's very issue. interesting. Yeah. But I mean, I, I wouldn't trade America for anything else in the world. So you have to take some of the things that make it a little bit more difficult for some of our efforts, I guess you would say. You have to take the bad with the good in that case. Yeah. I mean, you know, the counter example, of course, is that uh, I can't recall his name, but in the 50s, there was a professor at Caltech, you know, of Chinese descent who was accused wrongly, apparently, you know, in the McCarthy era of being a communist and he was he was a genius engineer and we kicked him out of the country basically and he went to china and founded their missile program and developed their uh, nuclear bomb you don't want to be accusing people who are brilliant you don't want to be driving them out of the us out of the us unless there's an important reason for it so it can go too far in that direction but at the same time there's a lot of intelligence vulnerabilities that are created and as you say it's a very thorny issue yeah, no question about it. Before we go on, I want to take a moment to fill you guys in on the newest tool I'm wearing and carrying in daily life. It's the Donovan non-metallic knife from Black Triangle. If you aren't familiar with Black Triangle, then you're really missing out. I love these guys because they put the dagger in cloak and dagger. If you've been following me for a while now, then you probably already know why Black Triangle has called their newest non-metallic knife the Donovan. It's named after General William Wild Bill Donovan, the head of the U.S. Office of Strategic Services during World War II. Under Donovan, the OSS was unconventional, unexpected, and highly effective, just like Black Triangle's tools. The Donovan is manufactured here in the United States. It's made entirely of G10 composite and comes with a thermoplastic sheath and a couple of amazing extras, which you'll have to see for yourself. You can find it at blacktriangle.com. That's B-L-K triangle.com. You can also get 15% off your first order with Black Triangle using the discount code SPYCRAFT101 or by navigating to blacktriangle.com slash SPYCRAFT101. I love mine and I know you're going to love yours too. So Dan, we've, we've talked a lot about the issue with these Chinese students coming over and potentially taking stuff back to China, but that's hardly the only concern on these campuses. And you had a couple of other great anecdotes, including the very famous one involving Ana Montes and Maria Velasquez. So can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. I look, of course, that has to do with uh, Cuban spying in the U.S. 
And a lot had been written about Ana Montes. Of course, she was one of the most damaging Cuban moles ever in the, in the U.S. government as a sort of uh, high-level analyst for, I think, the Defense Intelligence Agency. And she kind of shaped our Cuba policy and meanwhile gave a lot of information about our policy, our people, and so on to, to Cuba. But I, So I focused on Margarita Velazquez, who recruited uh, Ana Montes when they were both at the Johns Hopkins SICE, a School of Advanced International Studies. And Marta went on, you know, she's a Cuban spy herself and worked uh, for the Agency of International Development. And it's an interesting story, for one thing, because she was from Puerto Rico and her father was a judge there. He was a supporter of Puerto Rican independence and he passed that on to her. And that was why she, one of the reasons why she was attracted to Cuba for ideological reasons, because, you know, the Castro regime supported Puerto Rican independence and uh, was kind of standing up to the United States. She was a, a fascinating figure in that sense. And of course, Cuba, there, there aren't many Cuban students in the U.S. because of the you know icy relationship between the two countries. And so Cuba often has to work through U.S. students. Of course, if you're from Puerto Rico, you're American, who were ideologically sympathetic. So she's an example of that approach by Cuba. And the fascinating thing is Montes, of course, was caught and, and I think sentenced to 25 years in prison. Velazquez, and she, she identified Velazquez but Velazquez had married, it had been in Latin America for the U.S. government, for AID. There she married a uh, Swedish diplomat. And uh, when things got hot for her, they went to Sweden, which doesn't extradite to the U.S. for political cases, including espionage. I and a Swedish journalist who uh, helped me out tracked her down there to uh, a school in Stockholm, a secondary school, where she was teaching Spanish and English. Probably is to this day. I haven't checked for a few years. But she's, you know, safely out of the reach of American authorities. But in a way, it's kind of poignant because the indictment was sealed for a long time before it became public. And so it was kind of a secret that she was, but she knew that she couldn't come back. And so her father died in Puerto Rico and uh, she couldn't go to the funeral. And none of the family and friends knew why, or at least the, the friends didn't, maybe the family did. And uh, so that was kind of sad. But I remember that I identified her as a teacher at this Swedish school and I, I, I interviewed the principal. And he said, oh, you know, we have this, I was telling me about the school. He said, we have this partnership with this company in, in California. We use their curriculum. I think it was Cisco Systems. He said, you know, we, we often send students and uh, staff to California to learn the curriculum and visit the, the headquarters. But he said, it's a funny thing, you know, Marta never wants to go. So we've offered <laughs> to her numerous times, you know, you can go to California when you want, you know, your turn. She always says no. And of course, the reason she was saying no was because if she set foot on uh, American soil, she would be arrested. So it was an interesting look at Cuban espionage and one fairly important spy who has kind of retired to a quiet life in Scandinavia. Yeah, that's a fascinating epilogue to the story for sure, because I've, you see things about Ana Montes everywhere. And I had heard Velasquez's name, but I didn't really know her story until I read it in your book. But for one yeah, thing- Yeah, I felt so many people be... had focused on Montes. And here was the person who recruited Montes and kind of her handler and no, you know, for a while and nobody knew, knew about her. Right, right, exactly. So how was she herself initially recruited by Cuban intelligence? You mentioned that she's, you know, independent minded for Puerto Rico, which makes her- her of interest, but how did they actually approach her? Did you ever find well, that that's, out? Well, uh, that's, you know, that's a good question. My memory is that she went to Princeton undergraduate and she did a thesis about the Castro regime, very about race relations in Cuba, which she, you know, complimented Castro for being enlightened and, and so on. I was very sympathetic to the Castro regime. And I believe in researching that thesis, she went to Cuba, spent some time there, I was given access to a lot of information and sites that might not normally be available. So my guess is that she was cultivated there and, and approached then or afterwards. Oh, wow. Yeah. It just sounds like she just dropped right into their laps in that case, if she came. Yeah, because it was an ideological. Research. She was quite eager, I think. Mm -hmm. It was also, you know, it was the Reagan era. Reagan was very anti-Cuba. There was the conflict in Nicaragua, and she was very opposed to the Reagan uh, policy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can see how she would stand out for sure. Besides recruiting Ana Montes, did, did she perform any other tasks that you're aware of? Any any major tasks? She did. There were there were some uh, some tasks listed in the uh, indictment. That you know, I think she identified a couple of American agents to to the Cubans and a few things like that. It wasn't anything on the scale of what Montes did, though. Yeah, that was the the jewel in her crown for sure. Right. So. 
she recruited Anna several, was it, let me, I'm trying to recall the timeline, but it was several years after she'd begun working. Wasn't, it wasn't an immediate thing, was it? They were, she recruited Anna when they were at Johns Hopkins. Okay. Yeah. Anna was not even working in the government at that no, time. She she wasn't, was she, right. Neither of them was, of course, they both went into the U.S. government afterwards. I believe that's the case. I'd have to recheck my, my files to make sure, but I mean, they went into the government shortly afterward is my memory. Mm -hmm. So she was just able to, I guess, appeal on ideological grounds because they were of close Anna's friends own. you know they had a lot in common mm -hmm. they took the same classes they they knew the same professors i mean they were pals at hopkins hmm. yeah i have to wonder how that moment goes and i'm not sure if we'll ever know when you know in this case like your closest friend reveals that she's working for a foreign intelligence agency but it's one that you're already sympathetic to i think you know, like again this like. is just check my book because it's been a while since i looked at it but i i think that you know velasquez arranged for montez again you know to to write some papers or do some kind of uh, writing or clerical work for somebody, and that somebody was Cuban intelligence, and she kind of eased her in. Okay, yeah, it's always an incremental process. It's not just a cold approach, for yeah. sure. I'm sure that wouldn't work very much. So Montez, like you said, she goes into government work, and I do want to talk about her for a couple of minutes at least, but she ends up in the Defense Intelligence Agency, right? And she's, I mean, she's just like the star analyst. Wasn't she, you said she was guiding U.S. policy practically? Yeah, she was the star analyst in, in uh DIA, and I think she was, you know, writing the, the sort of intelligence assessments of what Cuba was likely to do. I think that she took a, a year off at one point and wrote to write a big assessment of Cuban policy, and it just gave the message that Cuba was eager for rapprochement or something, which was probably the message that Cuba wanted to convey. Yeah, she was in a position to know a great deal about both American policy in Cuba and American intelligence operations in Cuba. She shared it all with Cuba. Hmm. Was Velasquez acting as her cutout for all of this, or did she just kind of step back once she had actually recruited Anna? I think that they maintained a arm's length relationship once after Velasquez recruited Montez because um, they didn't want they didn't want that friendship to continue because they thought it might look suspicious. And of course, Velasquez, you know, Montez was in the U.S. And Velasquez was overseas on various posts for AID. So mm, I don't think right. they worked closely together after the recruitment. Okay. So how did Montez continue her activities for so long without being caught until the early 2000s? She was very smart. You know, I think she she did use sophisticated tradecraft. I forget what exactly, but she was impressive in meetings. She knew her stuff cold. I don't think she exposed herself needlessly. I think that, you know, not, not everything she wrote or recommended was obviously to Cuba's benefit. You know, I think she was smart enough so that some of her policy recommendations and so on might, might have looked tougher on Cuba than others. So that I think mm -hmm. she was careful not to leave like a, a totally obvious trail. But nevertheless, she eventually came under suspicion. I think both well, yeah, by fellow sense. analysts and, you know, from people who had former Cuban intelligence people who were giving the U.S. government information. Oh, that's right. Yeah, because we had some defectors. Yeah, the defectors will always sell you out. That's been a common theme in some of my podcast episodes, for sure. Yeah, I mean, sooner or later, the, the, you know, there's going to be a defector who knows about you. Right. Is that how she was caught? Was it a defector that named her or almost named her anyway, or was it some other way? I that think she it was a combination of defectors and internal suspicion that led to internal investigation. But because I focused on Velasquez, I don't know quite as much about Montez. Gotcha. Gotcha. Right. Yeah. I mean, Velasquez, anybody can look up Anna Montez right now, but you're kind of the, the go-to guy for Velasquez, sorry, for sure. So Velasquez, she, she married a Swedish diplomat, like you mentioned. Did that give her any kind of diplomatic immunity as well as a family member, or is it just a coincidence? Well, I think that's a good question. I don't think she had, I don't know for sure. It's a good question. I mean, what she, they did was they went back to Sweden. And mm -hmm. and in Sweden, like I said, it was out of the reach of the U.S. because it doesn't extradite for political cases, or it didn't at the time. So she didn't need that diplomatic immunity. But whether she would qualify for it, I, I don't really know what the rule is on that. Yeah, that's interesting. I guess hmm, I'll have to look it up. Yeah, I don't know what the family member status is. If you're not the actual diplomat who's employed as a diplomat anyway. Yeah, that's a good uh, question. Your, I didn't really think about it. Hmm, did your partner the in Sweden, did he actually have a chance to interview her or just find out where she was working? He went to her house, but she wouldn't uh, come out and talk. And I emailed her. I got her email address and she wouldn't 
respond. Yeah. I thought there was a chance she might because we're kind of the same age. We're in college at the same time. And so I'm not, I didn't go to Princeton, but I thought maybe the, there was some of this. She was active, I think, in, in college against uh, apartheid, you know, and I mean, I, I sympathized with that view, of course, too. And so on, but she didn't respond and wouldn't come to the door when my colleague knocked. Hmm. And that's, we, that's unfortunate. And he also went to the school. I interviewed the principal of the school by phone. He went to the school, interviewed a couple of the, her colleagues, but again, she wouldn't. Uh, she wouldn't talk. Uh, I don't uh, think he ever actually encountered her in person. I got you. Well, that's a shame. I'd like to hear it in their own words for sure. Yeah, me too. I would have loved to talk to her. Yep. So there's there's another person I want to cover as well. Anna's in prison now. She's been in prison since I don't know, close to 20 years now, right? So she's coming up on the end of her sentence if she got 25 years. I think. Yeah, you're right. Good point. Yeah, thank. Maybe I'll try and invite her on the podcast then. What you Yeah, that. yeah. <laughs> That'd be a good one. So there's I think another guy. For a while, they were talking about trading her to Cuba for somebody. You remember that? There was a lot of articles about that a couple of years ago, but I don't. I guess nothing came of it. Hmm. Yeah, I'll have to look for that for sure. I yeah, know that she's some discussion. I believe yeah, there was some discussion of it. Okay, yeah, I'll have to look that up for sure. That's not bringing anything to mind at the moment, but I mean, that's what they do. These yeah, we wanted a, 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 a criminal, like a murderer who had refuge in Cuba and Cuba wanted Montez. There was discussion of a swap, but I guess it didn't happen. Hmm. Okay, yeah, yeah, it might be viable. Get I think somebody somebody been... could look it up on Google and check, but that, that's my memory. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, I'll have to look that up as well after we get off the line for sure. So there's another guy in your book that I really wanted to talk about because he's such an interesting case himself, and that's uh, Glenn Schreiber, who is kind of, in some ways, the last guy I would expect to end up working for a foreign intelligence service, but he was recruited during college as well. So can you tell us a little bit about Glenn Schreiber? Yeah, I think he was actually recruited a little bit after college. He was a kid going to college in Michigan. He went on a study abroad program in China, and he loved China, and he loved it there. He went back to his, his Michigan University, started learning, you know, learned Chinese. And then after he graduated, went back to try and work and have some fun for a few years anyway in, in, in China. And he was a good-looking kid. I think he made some money as a model or in ads. But he wasn't making a lot of money, and there was an ad in the paper looking for somebody who could uh, write political essays. And he answered the ad, and a charming uh, woman who I think called herself Amanda, if I remember rightly, cultivated him and eventually introduced him to her bosses. They met in a hotel room. Of course, it turned out it was Chinese intelligence. They paid him a fair bit of money. I think it was over a few years of dollars to try and get into the State Department or the CIA. And he, he took the entrance exams, but I think for foreign service, maybe. I think he failed the entrance exams. And then eventually he took the CIA, you know, entrance exam for the CIA. They called him up and they said, you know, come see us because you just have to go through a few things before we hire you. And uh, he came and it turned out to be a ruse. They had realized that he was taking money from the Chinese intelligence and he went to prison. It was interesting. The FBI made a, made a movie about it. Essentially, it was shown at a lot of college campuses, warning people about that they might get approached on study abroad programs. So actually, he was, he was approached later, not while he was on the study abroad program, but you know, it wasn't a huge leap to, to, to think that. But it was an interesting case. He was a cocky kid, is, is my impression. Bright, cocky, thought he could outfox anybody. And I think he probably didn't realize that once he took the money from the, the Chinese intelligence that they owned him because if he went to work in the State Department of the CIA and uh, he didn't provide them information, they could always just tip off the U.S. intelligence. So that was his, so it was kind of a, a tale that the FBI has used a lot to uh, warn American students abroad and American, I guess, recently graduated alums that you could be approached in, in China and you have to be on your guard. Yeah, it's, it's a fascinating story. I, I'm not recalling the name of that FBI training film right now, but it's surprisingly well done and entertaining, even if you're not interested in this kind of topic. Honestly, it was I was I was really impressed and it's something that's easily shared. It's kind of well acted and well produced and an interesting true story and all that. So that was that was good to see for sure. But Glenn, he, he was not like the others. He was not ideologically motivated. He was just having a good time in China and wanted to keep the party going. Is that kind of 
Yeah, I think he needed right money. Deal? You know, he didn't come from wealth. He didn't have a, a steady, you know, high income job in China. And so he jumped at the chance to make some money writing these essays. Yep. And yep. I don't I think, think I think mentioned. that his he might have had a vaguely sort of anti establishment view of the world, you know. He wasn't an ideologically committed Chinese communist or anything like that. He just, he wanted the money. It sounded like fun. He thought he was in control, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. It sounds like the, the cockiness is what got him and the need and the money. But it's it's interesting to see the incrementalism of it with, you know, it sounds pretty harmless if you just write a paper for a couple of hundred bucks about, you know, a totally unclassified subject, just a way to make some money. And that's how they set the hook to begin with and just start offering more and more and more and dragging deeper and deeper and deeper into it. Sure. It's a uh, time-honored way of, of getting it done, right? Absolutely. So was he just an attractive candidate because he was an English-speaking American guy that was over there and available? I mean, he didn't have any government aspirations before they convinced him to start applying to these government jobs, did he? Did he? I don't think he I don't think he had the strong government aspiration. I think that they placed that aspiration in him. But I think that, you know, it's not a situation where that newspaper ad was necessarily targeted to him alone. I mean, I think they they placed those kind of ads and they wanted to see, you know, what the ads brought in. And they may have approached 10 other students for, or 50 or whatever might have answered the ad and they might have kind of taken their pick to see who they could ensnare. So I don't think right, it was, right. they probably didn't have a situation where they're saying, Glenn Duffy Shriver is the one guy in China that we need to recruit for us. Let's put this ad and get him in. I think it was more, let's put this ad and see who we can track. And he, he might've been on their radar, but he probably wasn't the only one on their radar. Yeah, I can imagine. I mean, for all we know, there were other people testing that same day with him, you know, that were on the Amanda's payroll, so to speak, because yes. there's zero risk to the Chinese government. You know, I mean, they lose some money if these kids get snapped up or fail the exam or whatever, but they lose nothing else at right. all. And they have a lot to gain as well. So it's it's a smart play on their part for sure. Definitely. I, I agree. So he took the exams and I think the training film showed one thing, but I'm not sure if it was 100% accurate. He went in for a polygraph exam or something and he, he failed the poly or he got too nervous to complete the polygraph exam. Is that right? Yeah. You know, that's my memory, but I forget if it's what actually happened or what was in the movie. Oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> but, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's to, been a while again, in. but I, I think he did fail a polygraph exam. They had they brought him in for, for questioning. Uh, he failed the polygraph. I think also they, he was coming into the U.S. with some of the cash from China, and I think that was something that was incriminating as well. Yeah, sure, more than $10,000 undeclared or something, I guess. I think so. I think it was 40000 or something like that. Right. So he had never actually accomplished anything for them other than taking the foreign exam service exam for Chinese dollars. Is that right? Yeah, Chinese. he didn't actually ever end up with a government job or, or was, was never of any use to the Chinese, you know, and might have indirectly been of use to the U.S. because they got to make a movie out of him and warn, warn other people <laughs> not to do the same right. thing. So it, it probably ended up being more more benefit to the U.S. than it was to China. <laughs> Wow, yeah. Thank you for your service, Glenn. Exactly. But it's, he, he didn't get a medal. Yep. Yeah, that's for sure. So is he still in prison right now or is he out already? I haven't checked for a, a while, but I, you know, my sense is he might be out. It, it wasn't a tremendously long sentence. I, I, you know, I have to check my book to see what it was, but right, for right. records, but he, he, you know, yeah, the, the I hope he's out and building a, a life, you know, because he didn't seem like a bad guy. I mean, he got entrapped. He was too cocksure and he made some bad decisions, but he, he was not a uh, career criminal. Right, right. It's it's I can hold I have a little bit of sympathy for somebody like that who gets sure. in too deep. I mean, there's young people do that in a wide variety of situations all the time. And he's you know, he was convicted and sentenced and he's paying his sentence now. So whenever he gets out, hopefully he just moves on. And to judge by that movie, you know, I mean, he was interviewed in the movie and he certainly seemed to have had regrets and thought about it more and, and kind of realized that he'd been heedless. Mm hmm. Absolutely. Did they, to your knowledge, did they give him any kind of specific instruction? Like, uh, for example, um, once you make it into the CIA, try to get assigned to the China desk or, you know, anything like that? Or is it just like, we'll see what happens? I don't think they'd, they'd gotten that far. Yeah, yeah. But that's I'm a long sure, I, I don't remember anything like that. 
Okay, yeah, that makes sense. They they might not even had very high hopes with him anyway after meeting him because it doesn't sound like he made it very far in the process. Yeah, uh, I'm not I'm not sure. I think that step one was getting him into the government and then seeing what would happen. You know, right, right. They have potentially you know twenty or thirty years to work with him at that point once he's already agreed. And if he's got any second thoughts, you know, they've got this clear money trail. You know, that'll send him to prison as it eventually did anyway. So he really there they own him. At that point, they're going to own him for the entirety of his government career and his life, really. That's right. That's right. That's what he didn't realize. Yeah. Fascinating stuff for sure. So he's paying his debt to society now. Then I love this book. Honestly, this is really interesting stuff. We've really only talked about maybe half of the content of your book. I always like to leave more for people to pick it up and read themselves. But everybody out there listening, I hope that you'll pick up this book, Spy Schools by Dan Golden as well. It's it's really, really riveting stuff, very eye-opening. Like I said, a lot of what I talk about is the Cold War, which ended 30 years ago now. And this is something that's happening right now. As a matter of fact, I think I saw an article yesterday about a Chinese-American professor who was indicted just this week based on economic espionage happening on campus. So it's very real. It's happening all around us all the time. And Dan did a terrific job of covering it in his book. Thanks so, so Dan, much. I really you- appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad we had the chance to talk about it. Are you working on another book right now? Yeah, I am. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to mention it. It's it's my first book that's not about higher education, actually. It's about ransomware. I have a co-author, a terrific reporter named Renee Dudley, and we just submitted the manuscript on New Year's Eve. Barr Strauss, Giroux is the publisher. It's called The Ransomware Hunting Team. Ransomware is when hackers penetrate a system of a person or a government agency or a school or a hospital, and they essentially paralyze the network, they disable it, and they say, you know, you got to pay us $100,000, a million dollars, whatever, then we'll send you the key so you can unlock it and uh, get it going again. The book's about this group called the Ransomware Ransomware Hunting Team, which is a group of about a dozen volunteers around the world who, for free and in their spare time, are brilliant code crackers. So what what they do is they can sometimes crack the ransomware codes and give the, you know, so that the victim doesn't have to pay the ransom because they can unlock the system, uh, unlock the code themselves. And so the hunting team has helped, you know, probably millions of people, certainly hundreds of thousands or in organizations, avoid paying billions of dollars in ransom. So it's through the narrative of this team, we kind of tell the story of the history of ransomware. And of course, it's emerged as a bigger and bigger threat. There was the attack this year, you remember, on the Colonial uh, Pipeline that shut down gasoline supplies in the American Southeast, you know, last spring. It led to kind of, a, you know, an awful lot of panic and, and shortages and so on. And there were a lot of attacks on hospitals during the pandemic and schools. So that's what it is, it's called the Ransomware Hunting Team, and it should be out around October from uh, Farah strauss Jeru. Wow. Okay. Yeah. I'm really looking forward to that. That's a fascinating and cutting edge topic for sure. And it's, and it's it, absolutely and it overlaps random. with a bit of the espionage side of spy schools, obviously, because some of these hacker groups have government ties. An awful lot of the ransomware attackers originate in Russia, where they seem to enjoy the protection of the Putin regime. So it's kind of an extension in some ways of some of the themes I explore in spy schools. Hmm. I'll bet. Yeah. It seems like a potentially great way for a government to funnel, you know, foreign dollars right into their accounts quickly and easily anyway and cause havoc in their in their you know hostile countries oh yeah yeah absolute win-win yeah that's an interesting subject i mean my own hometown the city government was was shut down by a ransomware attack a few years ago and they ended up having to pay and i know a lot of people have to pay just so that you know the citizens could get back on their feet after five or six day of no city services whatsoever yeah this this team that we write about they can crack the ransomware if there's a mistake in the code. You know, they're brilliant at analyzing mm-hmm. it and finding a vulnerability in the in the encryption code. But if ransomware is done perfectly, then there's nothing they can do because it's unbreakable. You know, so they 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 primarily are effective when you know that the hackers have made some mistake and don't realize it, and then they crack the vulnerability and they try and keep it quiet as long as they can that they found a problem because they don't want the hackers to realize it and fix the code. So mm-hmm. they help as yeah, many vol- victims as they can before the hackers gangs get wind of it and uh, buttress their coding. Wow. Wow, that sounds like quite a dynamic. Yeah, I look forward to reading that. And you said it's called the Ransomware Hunting Team? Yeah, the Ransomware Hunting Team. Good, good. Yeah, I look forward to that for sure. Yeah, this was Spy Schools was riveting, so you've got a great narrative style, so I look forward to that one as well. Thanks. I, I, I appreciate that. 
Sure. All right. Well, well, thank you so much for coming on, Dan. This has been a real pleasure. We learned a lot today for sure. Thanks, Justin. It's been my pleasure too. And nice talking okay. with you. Absolutely. <clears throat> As always, thanks for listening to this episode of the Spycraft 101 podcast. If you're interested in supporting this program and all my other efforts, you can subscribe to my page at patreon.com. My patrons get exclusive access to long-form blog posts that dive deep into some of the most amazing stories in the history of espionage and receive free or discounted books and products from the Spycraft 101 store. That includes a free PDF copy of my own book, Spy Shots Volume 1, 101 True Tales from the World of Espionage. I want to say a special thank you to everyone who's been a supporter for the last few months. Here's a quick message from one of my current patrons about why they chose to subscribe. I listen to Spycraft 101 for the crazy stories of real people doing real things. Fantastic guests that describe amazing operations that are so outlandish that if it was in a book, I'd dismiss it as too far-fetched. Justin manages to deliver enthralling stories every episode. You can also find lots more content on my Instagram page at spycraft101 or at my website, spycraft101.com. Thanks again, and I hope you'll stick around because there's lots more to come. Mm -hmm.